So what would the world look like if Russia wins the war in Ukraine? I'm sure you've heard a bunch of different opinions on that front, but speculate no further. We've got an article here set in the future laying out that hypothetical situation. Now, it's titled Nightmares If Ukraine Loses, and it was written by Edward Lucas in the Center for European Policy Analysis. Now, just again, hypothetical. This is set in the future. It's not reporting anything that is currently happening. Uh, there's some pieces in here I agree with. You can kind of see how we get from one to two. Others, not so much. And overall, I do think it's missing one big aspect uh, that could really bring this home. And I'll get to that here in a moment. Now, Lucas starts out by saying, it is February 2025, setting the stage. Within hours of taking office, President Donald Trump says that American aid to Ukraine will cease. Three weeks later, Russian drones and missiles are defeating Ukraine's depleted air defenses. Heating and power systems are collapsing. In sub-zero temperatures, millions flee from uninhabitable cities. On the front line, a Russian counteroffensive is breaking through. Out of ammunition, luck, time, and options, the Ukrainian leadership grasps at a Chinese brokered truce. So the reason I thought this article was worth getting into is just this whole concept of what does Europe, what does the world look like after this war in Ukraine? I, I feel like we haven't really dialed that in, right? There's a lot of talk of who's going to win, who's going to lose, but but how does that actually play out? I feel like it's somewhat missing from the discourse. So on, on this piece here, I do think it's a little uh, speedy, and you'll see this throughout the piece, the idea that Trump takes office in this scenario, he wins. Of course, that's still very much a toss-up at this point, or not decided, I guess, haven't had the elections. Um, the idea that aid would stop that quickly, I think, is unrealistic. Uh, there's there's a lot of moving parts to that, not just in the executive branch, uh, but across the U.S. government. So I don't think it would be that quickly, as in Trump makes an announcement or the future president makes an announcement and then it stops, stops shortly thereafter. The second piece is this kind of uh, supposes that should US, the U.S. stop military aid, that all of a sudden Ukraine does not have the means to defend themselves. And I don't think that's accurate. It, I, I would expect that should the U.S. step back from kind of leading the charge in military aid to Ukraine, Europe would step forward. Again, that might be one of the conversations about don't just stop it on a dime, but start to transition out. Now, that doesn't mean that Europe has the capacity as we sit here today to provide the military resources that the U.S. has so far. But again, just the U.S. leaving does not leave Ukraine completely undefended. Continuing on, they say NATO membership is postponed indefinitely under the armistice. Insecurity makes the ruined economy uninvestable. Membership in the European, Un European Union looks vanishingly unlikely. So to be fair, that's kind of the situation we're in right now, right? NATO membership postponed indefinitely. It's kind of where it sits while the war is, is raging. Uh, insecurity it makes uh, the ruined economy uninvestable. There are some international firms investing in Ukraine, but not nearly as many as they would during peacetime. So that's kind of the situation. And membership in the European Union, you know, in some cases it's moved along faster than expected, but it's, it technically hasn't completed. So it, it's not hard to see that situation just uh, move forward to right after a war would be complete. They say, in Russia, Vladimir Putin is triumphant. His war of aggression, once mocked for its recklessness, is now vindicated. Sanctions remain on paper, but with the West's political will broken, they are easily evaded. While Ukrainians are plunged into poverty, Russia's economy booms. Now, I do think the longer that sanctions are in place, the more likely it is for any country to find ways around it and find ways for their economy to function without, uh, you know, with those restrictions in place. Again, kind of moving quickly here, I don't know that... Uh, in a, a, just over a year from now, all of a sudden the Russian economy is booming. Seems a little quick, but I understand where they're understand where they're trying to get at here. But before going any further about how the world is just going to completely fall apart, let's talk about something positive: pursuing a career that you're actually interested in. You know, if you've ever wanted to learn more about gunsmithing, firearms repair, or shooting sports management, Sonoran Desert Institute is worth checking out. The online programs at SDI cover armor courses, gunsmithing, ballistics, woodworking and finishes, shooting sports management, and more. Plus, tools and materials are shipped to your door for hands-on practice. SDI is DEAC recognized and can be a great way to kickstart a career you're actually interested in. Visit sdi.edu or call 480-999-4767 to learn more. And of course, thank you to SDI for sponsoring this video. 
They continue saying for the incoming Trump administration, China is what matters. Europe has failed and is not to be taken seriously. NATO remains on paper, but as the new president said in his inauguration speech, I give you notice the United States is not going to war to protect some fields in southern Lithuania, nor protect countries that have for decades failed to pay their premiums. Those 31 words destroy the credibility of the 49 words in Article 5, the Collective Security Clause of the North Atlantic Charter. This is written, this is really written like a report after the fact. So it's kind of hard to dissociate there. Uh, a couple thoughts, though. Not crazy at all. There's plenty of people who, who strongly believe we need to be almost exclusively focused on China, and that's going to come back up in the article here in a little bit. I am personally of the belief that we can focus on more than one thing at once, and that uh, China and the defense of China is intertwined with Ukraine and uh, Russia's aggression there. I don't think we can completely separate those two, but it's also not crazy that a future president decides to make that shift and put all of our eggs kind of in the Pacific basket. It's hard to see a scenario where somebody says Europe has failed and is not to be taken seriously and like the United States policy shifts in that direction. I just, I, I understand where they're getting at there. You know, the idea that Europe should have picked up more of the burden uh, in supporting Ukraine against Russian aggression. But again, this kind of makes it seem like that's it, gigs up, we're out of here. I, I don't think that it would be anywhere near that fast. It'd be a slow pivot, if anything. And then of course, the, the challenge here, I don't think the United States is leaving NATO anytime soon. I think it's an important alliance in a lot of ways. But of course, if a president or a leader of any country says we're not going to adhere to the collective security clause, you know, what good is the alliance then, right? They continue by saying, far from constraining Russia, the new Trump administration seeks to woo it as an ally against China. I think that's a step too far. I, you know, even if that's something that the new administration wants to do, uh, American weapons have killed Russians, a lot of them in Ukraine. I don't know that uh, there's a, a any sort of alliance in the short term between the United States and Russia. Back to neutral, maybe, and not adversarial, possibly sometime in the future. But allies? Seems like it's a bridge too far for now. They say, without American leadership, the countries closest to Russia are in a frenzy of anxiety. They know how quickly the Kremlin's war machine will be ready for action again. This is something I've pushed back on quite a bit. Uh, I recognize that letting Putin succeed in Ukraine, or, or if he were to succeed in Ukraine, is 100% understand the argument that that could lead to further expansionism going forward. I don't know that the Kremlin's war machine will be quickly ready for action again. I mean, they've taken a beating in Ukraine. Uh, even if they were to come out on top, they've taken a lot of losses and have fired a lot of munitions and gone through a lot of tanks, armored fighting vehicles, helicopters, planes, all that stuff. You know, I don't know that I would agree that we're going to blink and they're going to be ready for war again with Poland or, or anybody uh, west, north, or south of Ukraine. They say, fast forward another few months. The loss of U.S. credibility in Europe has spread to Asia. Nobody wants to be the next Ukraine. They quote a fictional Japanese politician saying, a country that cannot deliver weapons reliably to help when a small conflict in Europe is not going to war for Taiwan, South Korea, or indeed any ally in this region. I don't know that I really buy many people are looking at the war in Ukraine and, and still referring to that as a small conflict in Europe. Um, you know, it's the largest land war in Europe since World War II. And it's not like we were just, we couldn't provide two or three tanks. Like we've provided billions and billions in military aid over the course of the last year and a half. So that's kind of the argument that I'm sure you've heard before, that if the United States stops supporting Ukraine for whatever reason, that will ripple out to our allies all around the world thinking all of a sudden they can't rely on the United States for anything. And you don't have to read between the lines because in this fictional scenario, that's exactly what the Japanese politician says. Continuing, they say the new administration tries to gather European support for a global coalition to counterbalance China's clout in supply chains, infrastructure projects, and international rule setting. But few countries are interested. We have learned that America first means allies last, says a fictional European diplomat. Why take the risk? So there you have it. We don't support Ukraine. That means that we lose all support from our allies in Asia and now our allies in Europe as well. So the entire you know, support that the United States has around the world is just, just collapsing. And then in wrapping up here, as this hypothetical situation just spirals out of control, they say, citing mythical Ukrainian provocations, Russia rips up the armistice and seizes more territory. I can see that, right? I mean, if you were to draw a line right now at the front lines in Ukraine and say, this is where the fighting is going to stop, we're going to have a ceasefire, you know, just based off of historical actions, it's hard to see a scenario where once the U.S. kind of loses focus or Europe starts to shift elsewhere that Russia decides they want a little bit more. Totally understandable, totally believable, I guess I should say there. And then China launches a naval blockade of Taiwan. 
They say, quote, have you called the White House, asks a desperate ally. Washington is silent, comes the bleak reply. So this kind of ties Ukraine support into the U.S. standing in the world going forward, right? We've got chaos erupting. Russia has, has, has free reign to do whatever they want in Europe. Our European allies have no interest in working with the United States anymore. And in Asia, China just says, enough, nobody's going to align with the United States. We're going to go ahead and make a move on Taiwan. And when they do, the United States isn't even around to make a comment, let alone take any action. So I do think it's a pretty interesting piece, kind of makes you think. Uh, definitely have to view this as worst case scenario, I think. Uh, I mean, in, in what they lay out here, it's like the United States, we just keep shooting ourselves in the foot one time after another. Now, one thing that I do think is missing from this assessment is, you know, if we're looking at an American audience, one of the arguments that it, it continues to come forward about stopping support for Ukraine, it, it's not about, you know, who gets to control territory in Ukraine or the sovereignty of Ukraine. It's not arguments about China's dominance in the Pacific and how the United States would be able to counter that. That's not the argument about the United States supporting Ukraine. It's what about us? What about focusing here internally, domestically for the American people, keeping us safe, doing things to, to help our citizens? That's missing from this piece. Now, so it, it would be kind of interesting to see a follow-up. You know, this very clearly lays out some big geopolitical moves uh, as to what this would mean all around the world, but it does stop short of what do all those geopolitical moves mean for your average citizen here in the United States. But that's all I got for now. Of course, I will link this article in the description below, as well as the national security sit reps I put out on Substack each week. But thanks for watching, and I'll see y'all next time.